So today we have a spectacular day. We have a spectacular number of people who have registered to attend. Uh, there's 86. A couple of people have called in to say that they're not well. Uh, so we wish them well. Uh, so thank you for coming to our farm. Uh, Alan and I have been here for 48 years. We've never used a synthetic chemical on this farm. It's all been based on compost tea, compost, fish, kelp, molasses, rock dust, uh, and everything that's growing here, we planted. There was nothing on this property when we came here other than grass. So all the trees, the big eucalypts and things that you see are all less than 48 years old. And we're very proud of what we've achieved here. And so we've always run cattle. Um, Alan is wandering back there with the cap. Uh, he, <laughs> he and I uh, started here uh, and have developed what we've got. Um, AgPath, I started in 1980 here uh, as a, um, a laboratory that would uh, look at soils and, 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 and any pests and diseases for farmers that were interested in that transition from the chemical paradigm to a biological or a biodynamic or a permaculture paradigm, but any sort of paradigm that protects the soil because what we're all about is protecting the soil. And the only thing that we can do for the future with the change in climate occurring uh, is to look after the soil, because if we can get the soil in good condition, then we will be able to transition into an agricultural system that will take us into the future. But synthetic chemistry will not do it. It has destroyed hundreds of millions of acres of land around the world, such that some land in some countries is now so toxic that edible foods cannot be planted on them. And so what we have to do is try to make the change where we're farming our soil, basically, uh, and looking after the soil. And it's very easy to do in the paradigm of re um, regenerative or, or biological or, or, again, as I say, there's lots of little names you can call it, but it's all about the same thing. It's all looking after the soil. So today uh, we're going to be, oh, well, no, today actually is the field day that is attached to a Sustainability Victoria grant that I got, and thanks to Andrew here and some of his SV people are out here. Um, this is our presentation of um, our research plots here on, on the AgPath site. Uh, also, just giving you a little bit of the data, because we had such a wet year last year, we were not able to get a lot done. Andrew is going to represent uh, Sustainability Victoria and tell you about what they do. And I would like to thank them really sincerely for uh, allowing us to have this grant. I'm, I'm a fairly new Victorian uh, from Queensland and I foolishly walked out the door today without a hat on because um, it's been months since I've needed a hat. And I come out here on this glorious day and, and, and find I need a hat. So we, you really have turned it on, Mary. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the organics industry and SV and, and try and um, paint the picture of why we funded this work and, and why we've sort of, I guess, created a partnership with Mary to, to, and, and her team to do this work. So first I'll introduce my... Uh, the, the, my team in SV, or not my team, our team. We've got Anna, who's our team leader. We've got Shannon there. Sh hands up, Shannon, who's our, our manager. We've got Renee, who's a, a, a project manager. And we've got Ian. G'day, Ian. You're all, all sitting together there. I'm glad to see you've got a hat on, Ian. Um, and thanks, everyone, for turning up. So I'll, I'll start off with talking about curbside bins. So when, when you go into the towns, I'm not sure if they have it in, in, in Garfield, but they have a, a, a cur curbside service. Um, some people have an organics bin, the green legged bin, some people, a, and a, a yellow bin and a, a purple bin for general waste. When we don't have an organics bin for organic waste, which is food waste and garden waste, can anyone guess how much organic waste is in the bin? when there's no alternative 
like, percentage-wise, from a from a family of four. Close, forty percent. It's it's quite amazing. Forty percent of what goes into an a residual organic spin. It can be fifty, but on average, just forty percent is organic waste, and that's a wasted resource. If that waste is composted instead of landfilled, it produces 20 times, 25 times less greenhouse gas emissions than landfilling, 25 times. So that's one of the reasons that the Victorian government wants to divert organic waste from landfill. The other reason is, is, is it's an excellent resource. And as Mary will demonstrate, it, the, the compost produced from recycled organics does great things for soil and is really part of the way forward with improving soil health and making more sustainable farming systems into the future. So it is a large resource. So we know in 2019-2020, there was 508,000 tonnes of municipal food waste produced. So that's basically curbside bins. So that's not composted. Some of that's composted, some of it's landfilled. That's 508,000 tonnes. There was 804,000 tonnes of garden organics produced in 2019-2020. In some of that was landfilled, but some of that was composted. And overall, in that year, there was 240,000 tonnes of compost produced in, in Victoria from that, that resource. And by the way, there was 380,000 tonnes of just mulch, garden mulch from parks and gardens that shredded. So we know that the, the population is growing as well. We know that the, the um, Victorian government is seeking to remove that waste from landfill and compost it. What that means is going into the future, there's gonna be a lot more than 240,000 tonnes per year of recycled organics compost produced. In fact, we recently funded a, um, a facility in Newbridge that's gonna process 150,000 tonnes on its own. We know councils are adopting, um, more and more councils are um, providing organic spins to their residents. And Ian, at the moment, how many do we have? Uh, 52 out of 79. So, 50, thank, thanks, Ian. 52 out of 79 councils have um, organic services for their residents, which means the 40% of organic waste that went in their residual bin can now be put in an organic bin and recycled. And it's the Victorian government's policy that um, by 2030, all, all um, Victorian residents will have access to organics recycling. So what that means combined with population increase in Victoria is we're gonna get more and more recycled organics hitting the market, more and more recycled organics available for, to farmers like you. So in order to prevent a market failure, we've got to grow that, those markets. And that's our role at SV, one of our roles, the role that the team here play. And Anna, how much, how much money have we invested in markets in the last three years? Just over three million. Beg your pardon? Just over three million. Just over three million dollars. And part of that funding's gone to Mary. So the reason we funded Mary's project is that one of the things that we've identified as a, as a um, I guess, not necessarily a barrier, but an unknown um, with regards to growing organic markets is how, how long it takes for the nutrients in that com compost to become available to plants and crops. So in other words, the mineral mineralisation rates, especially nitrogen. So, and, and Mary, I'm sure you'll talk about this more, but as, as soil health changes and improves, um, the, the rate at which those nutrients in the compost become available also changes. As the type of compost changes and becomes better or worse, better we hope, the rate at which that, those nutrients mineralise and become available to the plant also changes. And essentially, you know, Mary, I'm not gonna steal your thunder, essentially, and that's just a basic explanation of what, what, what we're doing. Um, and and that's, that's why we funded it. So at the end of Mary's project, one of the things we'll, we'll publicise and, and, and share amongst you and, and farmers elsewhere 
um, is, is um, an analysis of that data and a report on, on those mineralisation rates. And at the end of the day, that means that you can make better decisions on how and when and why you plant, apply compost and therefore grow the market. I think, was it back in 2020 or something, when we were writing up the proposal that uh, I, I got a call and then we ended up talking to, to Mary about like, oh, how are we going to detect um, odours and the gases coming out from, from the compost? And, you know, uh, we were very much separated by, by COVID, but actually we managed to work it all out and get a proposal in and, and you know, successful uh, grants uh, from SV, so which was really great. So um, for me, um, I've been really uh, excited to be, work on, to, to be working on this project. Uh, I'm a soil scientist by training, uh, did my PhD at Monash Uni, and uh, I essentially, you know, but what, what we are interested in, of course, here is that uh, in the use of an electronic nose for the detection of odours and gases in the composting uh, process. And so what we've actually done is actually to, to use uh, an e-nose that was developed by the Digital Agriculture Food and Wine Group. And we have a couple of representatives here today. Uh, I'd be happy to introduce you to them, uh, which uh, that group, research group I'm uh, quite closely affiliated with. And so um, the electronic nose essentially uh, is composed of an, an array of, of sensors. And those sensors actually uh, are sensitive to uh, particular gases that are emitted from the compost. And uh, what we did, of course, when the material came in, was to apply the um, electronic nose to detect, uh, to, to just evaluate if um, you, we can use a low cost, highly efficient uh, electronic nose to detect and measure odors coming off from the compost, from the windrows. Uh, compared to much more, um, I guess, tedious uh, techniques and you know, uh, time lag techniques that involve capturing of gases, um, bringing them back to the lab, putting them through an expensive, sophisticated machine and analyzing them. Um, and so what we did was to apply the ENOS readings, because they are sensitive to various gases, to uh, different locations on the windrow because we also wanted to detect how whether there are any variations along different positions on the windrow that you'll see in the field, um, as well as um, whether we can distinguish with on windrow and fresh air or open air readings, as well as distance readings. So um, what we found in our analysis, uh, we use a range of different uh, techniques to, to analyze, but um, what we've been able to find is, of course, the enos. Uh, from the results, we've been able to find pretty good uh, detection ability for uh, some different positions on the windrow, but definitely between an open air and on windrow uh, condition, as well as between a distance uh, positions and the on windrow uh, positions as well. So. Essentially, I have a handout that I will pass to you uh, later. And we also have the enos on hand as well uh, with my colleagues over there, Natalie, Natalie uh, Harris, uh, RA, a PhD student, and uh, Claudia uh, uh, Gonzalez, who is a uh, research fellow postdoc with us. So yeah, we'd be happy to just sort of let, let you have a look at it. Uh, as well. So, so essentially what we have found and the data, you know, we've uh, shared it with the team as well, um, is that um, the electronic nose can be used for a range of, uh, can be used for detecting odor from, <laughs> from, from, from the windrow. Okay, so, um, but the, the next step for that uh, is actually, uh, we have a control uh, experiments uh, plan out. We've had a first round of experiments done already to test the um, enos in a much more controlled condition because in the open field condition, it can get quite noisy, the data. So in the lab, uh, as Natalie has run some of those uh, uh, lab trials, uh, it's getting really good uh, results uh, there based on samples that we've taken from the field. So also, yeah, thanks for allowing us to take the samples and yeah, analyzing the data. Um, yeah, so 
the that's that's what we found. The next step is actually capturing um, the gases from uh, that lab condition and then putting them through um, a GCM as a gas chromatography mass spec to actually quantify and identify the specific uh, gases uh, with those enos readings. Okay, so that's the next step. Uh, we can tell you more about it if you if you want. Um, the enos has been used for a range of uh, different purposes as well. So detecting, for example, um, and, and, and Claudia and Natalie can tell you more about it, detecting smoke taint uh, in wine, um, beer, uh, sensory characteristics, um, and a whole range of uh, other um, applications as well. One of the reasons why the work that we're doing at Melbourne University um, is important is that the, the, uh, a lot of the waste receival stations are in sort of suburbia. And so if you have a waste that may be putrefying, uh, then there's going to be people around in the vicinity uh, complaining, rightly so. And so one of the reasons why we're using the ENOs is to try and determine, uh, first of all, what's coming off, that, that fundamental science, but also just how far that, um, those odours are likely to create a problem within the suburban areas, because we can't take those stations away easily. Uh, they're convenient. So this particular work is going to be really useful for us to understand how quickly we have to combine the potentially wet food waste into the green waste uh, to minimise any chances of putrefaction uh, uh, so, so that we won't have to have this problem. So um, yeah, it's really good work in our department in there. Now, um, Eric, thank you for coming down from Sydney. Uh, Eric has just arrived. He is uh, part of an organisation called CORE, which is the Centre for Organic Education, no, Centre for Organic Research and Education. Right. Uh, and he's here to talk about also the work that they do uh, within the organics industry uh, up in New South Wales. So thank you for coming down, Eric. Much appreciated. I'm Eric Love. I'm the Chairman of the Centre for Organic Research and Education Limited. We're a, a, a public charity that's dedicated to the environment in, and specifically we're dedicated to utilising recycled materials and, and in particular uh, recycled organic materials. Uh, CORE is uh, 25 years old. We started in the mid 90s. So, you know, we've been at this game for a long time and um, uh, it's great to see, uh, you know, some research going on here for uh, into the area. But I've been involved in research probably for all that time, for you know, 25 years. I did the first trial of um, collection. I come from the waste side and look, my, my claim to fame is I introduced wheelie bins into Australia in, uh, in the 80s. So, you know, that's giving my age away a bit, Mary, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and that was quite a a challenge to do it. and a lot of people go oh, no, haven't we always had those you know this is a quite a younger generation uh, and I said no and it was actually quite difficult quite a difficult thing to do because like any change uh, it um, it came with its share of detractors and we don't want these big ugly grey things in our backyard and um, so um, so that was that was waste. So what we did when we when we put it into a wheelie bin, of course, was get it all into one place. And prior to that, it was uh, being taken to landfill in trailers and spilling out all over the place. And look, landfills <laughs> changed quite a bit in that time as well. It was uh, basically dumped. Uh, not a very uh, pleasant um, thing at all. Uh, and then uh, look later on, uh, I got involved in using wheelie bins for recycling. Again, that was, it was a bit of a challenge to do that. Uh, uh, we had crates. I don't know if anyone remembers the, the crates that, uh, that used to go out on the curbside. And uh, look, they were probably responsible for most of the litter in the ocean, in my opinion, because they just blew away. Uh, they just blew litter all over the place. So, so my, I come from a waste background. And in Sydney, uh, in the 90s, 
we all of a sudden realised, hey, we're running out of landfill. We tried to get a landfill at uh, a place called London Derry, and that was rejected uh, completely. Uh, so look, we, we all got together in the early 90s and thought, look, we, we better do something to preserve landfill, and that was um, to commence you know, curbside recycling. Of course, the Scouts and other um, people have been doing glass and paper for you know, quite a while. Uh, but um, <laughs> there was all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful ways. Again, a crate was introduced to do that, and, and again, it was uh, you know, quite, um, quite a, a, a litter thing. Uh, by the early 90s, um, I took on the position of uh, president of the Waste Management Association of Australia. And as part of that, we, uh, we carried out some trials uh, some uh, trials of collecting, how do you collect this stuff? And funnily enough, even back then, you know, um, 25, 30 years ago, we were collecting food as well because we wanted to just get a bit of an understanding of all that. It took a long time for everyone else to catch up, of course. Uh, but um, so, uh, so we did some collection trials and we kind of established, yes, it's quite possible to collect it. Um, then, uh, um, then the, uh, the next thing that happened when I was uh, president of the association, we realised that we needed a, an industry organisation to, you know, to represent the interest and to negotiate with government, etc. So I'm giving you a bit of a history lesson here. I don't, I don't, hope you don't mind the history of compost in uh, of recycled compost in Australia. Um, Forgive me if I, uh, if I lose track when I divert like that. But we decided that we needed an industry association, so we set up an organisation called Compost New South Wales, which was the first industry association of its kind in Australia. And because it was the only one, it was Compost New South Wales, but everyone from everywhere joined from all over Australia, so it was a very popular thing. And then from that, we ended up with you know, Compost Victoria and all the states put their own compost... Uh, um, organisations together, which of course now is called um, AORA, the Australian Organic Recycling Association. It's no, it was no longer it's no longer part of the Waste Management Association. It's going off doing its own thing and doing some great work in that area. The um, I suppose going back then, you know, there, there, there was some interest and, and uh, there, there was quite a few presentations. Uh, vermiculture was very, uh, very uh, common in those days. Uh, people could see the benefits of worms, you know, going through all the waste and converting it into vermicompost. And I recall a... Uh, one conference I went to where, where a speaker stood up and he went, yeah, yeah, it was all fantastic and, and uh, told us all about his um, you know, uh, uh, vermiculture um, technology. And I just put my hand up and, uh, and particularly the, the worm we. And I have a point uh, in doing that, Mary. Uh, so the worm we, um, he said, oh, no, it works, it works really well. We're getting you know, better productivity and so on and so on. And so I stuck my hand up and says, well, wh why do you think that is? And uh, he said, oh, it's because it's got the life force. <laughs> and of course, that was you know, a very scientific uh, description of what it was. And I said, well, you know, can you get any clearer than that? He said, no, it was the life, uh, the, it's the life force. It, it turns out that you know, while he didn't know, Later on, we're a, as Mary mentioned, we're a research and an education organisation and we've been re researching the use of compost for 25 years. Uh, one of the experiments we did was fluorescent excitation emission matrix studies. Now that's a mouthful. It took me a long time to learn that, so I'm just showing off by, uh, by uh, being able to you know, say what that is. And that was looking at the, the main reason we did that is because there was concerns that the leachate from compost was very harmful. Uh, you know, like we're looking at um, uh, odours in food, then it was kind of all about leachate. Uh, oh, we can all get into the ground. Uh, anyway, I did that for a particular reason. I'll, I'll get on to that. Uh, so we decided to do this theme analysis and 
what we discovered is it does have the life force. And I know what the life force is. It's, it's tryptophans, tyrosine, proteins, which are amino acids uh, that are actually the start of life itself. You know, that's where life started from with these, you know, protein amino acids. Uh, and so he was absolutely right. He just didn't know how to put that into, uh, into exactly what it was. And that's why, you know, we've got brilliant researchers like Mary at the moment explaining all those things to us in a very, um, you know, scientific manner. So that, uh, that theme work was great. Uh, look, it ha also had nutrient traces in there as well. So there was a bit of nutrient. So there was some, probably some cause for concern about do the nutrients get into, um, get into waterways, do they leach? Well, they do leach because I, I understand from Mary that the, one of the best plots uh, of all is the um, liquid compost, the compost tea which is kind of a similar thing to wormwee. It's probably, I, I don't know how similar it is. I haven't analysed wormwee because, uh, you know, vermiculture kind of uh, didn't achieve the heights that people thought it did because worms are very difficult creatures to try and manage on mass and uh, look, they, they die out. And then, anyway, so we didn't go on with, uh, with having a look at that, but uh, this theme analysis showed us that, um, uh, that you get good productivity and, and I think Mary was saying in one of our recent meetings that actually the, the compost tea has the best result. In the early, in the early stages, I would add, because uh, one of the things that we do as, as core is we work in agriculture and we provided a lot of free material, including in Victoria. We provided a lot of free materials through Metropolitan Waste Management Group and various others. Uh, to farmers, uh, um, one thing we, uh, oh, sorry, I've just lost my train of thought again, I'm sorry. Just uh, producing, the, you're giving out free? Yeah, so look, we, we provided that free compost to farmers and they found it really good and that was a market development um, initiative. And I'd say while we get involved in research, we're very much on the ground research and that was, you know, provide compost to farmers and try and measure uh, what that meant in terms of, you know, productivity gains, in terms of soil structure, uh, in terms of um, um, uh, moisture holding capacity, which is a big one because we'll, well, it looks like we're just about to get into drought again, so moisture holding capacity was a big one. And look, we, we tried to quantify that in terms of what does that mean economically? And obviously, if you've got better water retention, then you're going to save on, particularly the irrigators are going to save on irrigation costs. But those who don't irrigate are going to have soil that retains moisture for a lot longer. So that we, we, we thought that was a pretty interesting uh, kind of finding and look all the things were positive there was positive savings there was productivity as I mentioned all the all the benefits that we probably all know about and have um, promulgated for many years but the result of that was um, my colleagues and I thought hang on it holds moisture it also holds nutrients um, you yeah, know maybe there's a role in water treatment in stormwater treatment. So this has been a passion of mine for, for many years. So using compost to treat stormwater. Now how about that? A lot of people you know, find that a bit hard to come out as well. I seem to get into all these things that have uh, you know, some resistance to, um, you know, to the change. And this is a big change. And look, we all know we've, we've dirtied up the water and pretty much trashed the earth. So we're we're, um, we're, we're pretty keen on this. So look, we started, uh, we, um, we had a look at some research that was going on in Washington state where they, some leaves had fallen on the ground and they tested the water going through the leaves and there was some uh, pollutant retention. We thought, oh, that's interesting. If we can do it, we can do it with just leaves. Yeah, you know, how much better would compost be and what sort of compost and what sort of mix design. So we've spent a lot of time um, 
developing mixes that uh, are used in biofiltration. Now, biofiltration is the, um, the purification of stormwater, because when stormwater hits the ground, of course, it picks up everything. It's got heavy metals, hydrocarbons, uh, um, nutrients, uh, metals, um, suspended solids, you know, it, it picks up quite a bit. And, and this is why we've got dirty water, because the stormwater just runs in. People say, oh, no, it comes out of the sky, it's quite clean. Yeah, it's clean until it hits the ground and then it picks up everything. So, so that, that research is kind of still going and uh, we've had a little bit of a look and Mary's given me some analysis on a couple of occasions to uh, see what, um, what the effect of different microbial populations has on the ability particularly to treat nutrients. Because it, it, with compost, it's a reactive material. With metals, it, it just attaches to the surface area and, and hangs on to it. But with nutrients, it's a completely different matter. And look, I don't know if I'm preaching to, the, um, to, uh, to those who know, uh, but uh, it, nutrients have to go through a cycle. And what we did discover was it took actually 18 months for us with a manufactured uh, material. It wasn't. Go it was its own material it was, that was put into a biofilter. It took 18 months for that population to establish to where we would consider it in the um, healthy soil category. So, so we came up, it's a nature-based system and that's really what we're about these days. We're about nature-based systems and you know, compost in agriculture, that's a nature-based system. But these, uh, the, so the microbial population built up uh, over 18 months and after 18 months we were getting uh, you know, good treatment results out of um, biofilters. So, where do we, where do we go from here? So, <laughs> so this is a, um, a, a bit of a story. Uh, and now, you know, we, we work all over the world because, you know, uh, the purification of stormwater is a very important thing to the, the future of mankind. The retention of it, the, the retention of the heavy metals and the, and the conversion of the hydrocarbons because compost converts hydrocarbons into inert materials. So hydrocarbons being oil and grease and so quite interesting a little diversion away from the, a lot of the work from our SAFER program, which was our sustainable amendments for agriculture, which essentially at that stage was um, recycled, you know, garden, garden organics. There was no food in it at that stage. So, um, so we thought, oh, this is interesting because again, one of the concerns of the market was the compost will leach and it'll leach into the waterway and make it worse because most engineers go, no, no, you don't want organics in, in the water. It, uh, you know, it'll um, putrefy, it'll cause uh, algal blooms and all that. So, so anyway, that's, which is the reason when I'm coming back to that theme study, which is one of the reasons why we did that theme study to identify, well, how bad is it? It's a bit like now we're looking at, you know, food in, in, uh, in the um, FOGO, the garden organics, food organic stream. Do we have an odour problem? You know, what problems do we have from that? Now, I've, I've actually started using FOGO. Hope, hopefully we know what that means now. A FOGO uh, in biofilters. And you know, what we discover is that, that the food adds to the nutrient content. We got, in our analysis, it was about probably 1% more in, uh, in nitrogen. Um, and look, and we didn't get any odours at all, but mind you, we're, we're a mixture. We mix it with other things like aggregates and, and uh, some various other organic materials. So we, we, we don't get any odours from that at all. That's not a problem. So here we are today. Um, you know, Fogo came on the stream. Um, came on stream. And, and to me, we, we, I reckon we, we did it all back to front. The biggest fraction of the waste stream is the organic stream. It's look, it's up to 50% of everything that we've been throwing away in the past. But we started with bottles and cans, which are, you know, uh, uh, bottles, cans and paper, which is a you know, very small fraction really. And, and it took till just recently to get the food, food waste out of the, 
the waste stream and start to look at how we might utilise that um, in the market. Uh, so, you know, I, I guess we've probably got, you know, quite a few farmers here today who are, who are thinking, OK, what's the NPK? And, uh, you know, and, and, and we do get the food adds that extra uh, nutritional value that uh, we, we've always said, oh, no, look, um, garden organics compost, it's not a fertiliser. It's a, you know, it's a structural organic you know, material that we can use to, to provide a base. And look, some people have used it as a base for you know, using you know, synthetic nutrients, for example. Not that I'm a, a big fan of that, being an ex-board member of the Organic Federation of Australia, the, you know, obviously the synthetic thing is not something that we, uh, we necessarily subscribe to. Um, <clears throat> so here we are today sitting here talking about some fantastic research done by Mary into the use of food organics in the waste stream. And it's the last, it's really the last thing in the domestic waste stream uh, that is, is now being recycled. And it, look, it's a strong government uh, you know, policy to you know, get that food out and get it in. And of, of course, it raises a lot of perceptions about you know what would what are the effects of doing that, and uh, look, I think Alex uh, Alexis has um, has shown that look that the odor is not really a uh, an, an issue that we have to worry about, particularly once it's matured. Um, in, in fact, I don't think it's enough. Is there any way we can increase the odor? I actually love the smell of compost. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm thinking, yeah, what, what are we, what are we really doing here with, uh, you know, trying to get the, uh, trying to get the odour down? I mean, if, if it was an odour of patrissable waste, oh look, I've been on some pretty ugly landfills around the world, and uh, you know, once that gets in your nose, it stays there for weeks. Uh, so you know, patrissable waste in a landfill is is an awful, awful thing, and that p particular patrissable waste is why we have. Why we've dirtied up the water and pretty much trashed the earth? Because the, the leachates that come out of that, that food, now that we've taken the organic stuff out, is, is extremely harmful. I mean, it's, it's also, also comes from residues of coke and milk and you know, everything else, makes this cocktail that, that just uh, is a, a very damaging thing. So, so we finally got to the point where we're getting out one of the major fractions, particularly in initially, uh, you know, food was, is, is a significant proportion of the waste stream. So now what we've got is, you know, pretty well full recycling of domestic waste stream. And some people are thinking of giving, getting rid of the, uh, the red bin. Of course, the red bin means a lot to me because I had a lot to do with the colorization of bins being uh, involved in, in that area for, you know, for many years. Um, you know, we came up with a color code and, and that color code said red bin for waste in the the yellow lid for you know recycling and purple for silotoxin you know, it's a, and the list goes on. So look, it's been a great pleasure for us. Um, Mary approached us and asked us if we would uh, be involved in this project, and it has been a great pleasure for for me personally and for our organisation to be involved in something that demonstrates what a lot of us already know, and that is uh, compost. Bogo compost or even uh, garden organic compost is extremely beneficial to soils. It's the natural cycle, the natural carbon cycle that promotes the water cycle. It's a very cyclic um, thing, this, uh, this compost. And it's, uh, it's, it's reactive, it removes pollutants. It, it, it captures nutrients and that's... In a stormwater application, you're trying to keep it out of the water, but in, in an agricultural application, you, you want to hang on to it there so the plants can, can access it and take it up and the microbial populations then, you know, break it down and we, we have mycorrhizal fungi forming and some very interesting, you know, micro, microbiological things happening. Uh, and it's, it's really a return to nature and the cycles of nature.